So uh, first of all, great to be here and to see a lot of friends and you know, new faces as well. Um, so actually, I need to say, to say a couple of things. I kind of have two different hats. Um, the hat from our design office. Actually, if you, we, we are here in Milan as well. We did the opening pavilion for Design Week this year. For those of you, it's uh, in Piazza Duomo in the, in the main square in Milan. And that's um, a pavilion with uh, four seasons at the same time. So if you go there, you'll be able to actually play snowball or you'll go through summer, wind, fall, uh, and spring as a way as an experiment to talk about nature coming back to cities, also climate control. But apart from that, today I'm here, I'll use a different hat. And I'll use the hat of uh, what we do at MIT, a sensible city lab, um, and talk, talk to you about mobility very briefly. So mobility, if you look at the city of the 20th century, that city was really built around mobility. That's, you all know this is freak slang with you know, the you know, mobility systems were shaped the city of the 20th century. And mobility is changing a lot because of this, because of convergence of digital and physical. So we all think that actually mobility in the 21st century will be very different, will create a, generate a very different city, a very different built environment. And so that's what I want to share with you with some of the projects we, we're doing today. For instance, today we can look at a city like this. Uh, that's a visualization we had at MoMA, at Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, it's something that was done by Pedro Cruz from our lab at MIT. Um, and uh, if you look at this, is Lisbon captured using billions and billions of data points collected, con collected from the taxi network. And the same data in New York looks like this. That's JFK Airport, every dot is a taxi pickup or a drop-off. That's a JFK, you zoom out, you see JFK was uh, down there, oops, well, whatever, was there. And then uh, um, you see Manhattan and all of the boroughs. And then you get a lot of data about mobility. So you can start asking yourself, you know, what you know, can you do with this data? And for instance, one question you can ask is, uh, look at this. In between two points in Manhattan, you've got hundreds of thousands of trips connecting them in the course of the year. And uh, so how many of those could be shared? Well, we started looking at that, asking that question. Uh, when you got big data, sometimes we say you need big math or new math. So we develop a network science approach to solve that question, to answer that question. Uh, you see the, this kind of um, uh, shareability network we are using to solve the problem. They tell you how many trips could be shared. You don't want to generate inconvenience to people, so you say mathematically, you can say, imagine you want to take everybody to destination when they need to be there, give or take a couple of minutes or a small delta that you define, then what is the minimum number of vehicles you, you need? And it turns out that in New York you could actually cut 40% of the fleet and still take everybody to destination exactly when they need to be there. Now, two interesting things happened with this. The first one is that the first results came out before. It's a project we're still doing. Actually, there's a paper coming out in Nature in a couple of weeks that will take this to the, the next level. Um, but the first results came out in, um, uh, before Uber launched Uberpool. And since then, we started a collabor collaboration with Uber. And as you know, Uberpool does exactly that. Allows two people going more or less in the same direction to share mobility. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that when this came out, the New York Times did a review of the paper and said, you know, well, you know what, that's interesting, but New Yorkers don't want to share anything, you know, any particular mobility. Well, it turns out that that's not the case. And I've been working with Uber on a lot of, uh, you know, their data together with them. Uh, and Uberpool has been a huge success globally. In San Francisco, over 50% of all trips every day actually happen by Uberpool. You know, and as I was saying before, it's two people going more or less in the same direction, sharing mobility, which means uh, one less vehicle on the road, which means less energy consumption, less pollution, and less congestion in, in our cities. Now, that's about New York. You might say it's a special city. The same thing happens in cities all over the world. There's some research work we've been doing looking at global shareability networks. So this one trend is about sharing rides. Another trend is about sharing cars. And the reason we can do it is that cars are becoming like this. Cars are becoming like computers on wheel. That's a, a, a mapping of some work we're doing with Audi Volkswagen on all the sensors that you have today on a car. And then, of course, you have the little sensor at the top, like this one, which is a LiDAR. What it does, it generates a three-dimensional scan of the city. You feed it into an AI system, and the car drives itself. 
And uh, you know, when the car drives itself, it becomes interesting. Because today, a car is usually parked 90% of the time. It's used 5% of the time. And then when it's not used, it also uses valuable space in our cities. So if we can change a little bit those numbers, things could actually change radically in the, in the city. The car can give you a lift in the morning when you go to your office, and then you give a lift to somebody else in your family or to anybody else in, in the city. And here are some of the results, you know, they show the work we're doing about, you know, looking at what happens, what would happen in New York if you were to convert New York into a fully autonomous self-driving fleet. Well, a few additional things. Um, if you look at this, you all know this, it's a well-known traffic light. And actually, traffic lights ended up on our roads when cars arrived on our roads. But if you've got an intelligence system where every car knows where it is and where all the other cars are, then you don't need to stop anymore at the traffic light. You can keep on going, just avoiding collisions, like this. Don't try it yet. <laughs> I once showed the video in Naples, and they told me, so what's new here? You know, I'm Italian, so I'm originally Italian, so I can make those jokes, but I have corroborating evidence from a former Italian minister, Minister Martino, who once said, in Milan, traffic lights are instructions, in Rome, there are suggestions. In Naples, there are Christmas decorations. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, again, if you look at the intersection, you got uh, a lot of interesting mathematical things. Uh, you know, it seems very simple, but you've got different frequencies of, of arrival. You've got uh, different trajectories. And what you see here, for instance, is um, a real intersection in uh, Singapore. To the left and to the right, the same number of cars. But actually, to the left, manage using the most intelligent <clears throat> traffic light system we have today, and to the right, manage using a slot-based system. A bit like in airports. A look at the difference between the left and the right in terms of number of cars waiting and uh, queuing and delays, uh, just you know, by changing the way you manage the intersection. The other interesting thing is actually that uh, usually the intersection is the bottleneck. The intersection is the place where two flows fight for the same real estate. So if you can fix the intersection, then you can fix automatically most of the urban mobility network. Now, I'm going a bit fast, just, you know, just we don't have much time. So a project we're doing in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, this is a beautiful city of Amsterdam. Not many roads, a lot of canals. So we started working a couple of years ago and say, what should we do? Well, we should do autonomous self-driving boats. We call them rowboats. And what can you do with a robot? You can use a robot to move stuff around. You can use a robot to move people around. You can use a robot to actually scan and sense air quality, water quality. But also you can use a robot in order to get like floating pixels. And then when you need a temporary bridge, you can combine them together. Or if you've got an emergency, you can create whatever you need. If you've got a concert, you can have a floating stage. Which, of course, you know, is nothing new. It's uh, what this beautiful city of Venice has done for a very long time. You know, that's uh, during the Festa, the Redentore, all the gondolas come together to create a temporary bridge. But, you know, I think, I like Paul Valéry, the great French writer, when he said, he said, you know, he has a quote that says, what I want from modern technologies is actually to help me do all things in a better way. And sometimes that's, that's really true about cities and smart cities. I'll show you very briefly some of the experiments. We are doing this a bit like drones, putting four engines, controlling them very easily. That's a f one of the first models we did, one to four scale. The final one is four times bigger. Uh, you see here the first video we took in the uh, canals in Amsterdam. It, also, it can also move laterally, it can be totally symmetrical. You know, I recently told the mayor, you know, no worries, you know, even if the project fails, we'll open a toy company because everybody seems to have so much fun playing with this on, on the canals. Now, a couple of things to finish. Uh, the first one is about, you know, introducing the next presentation. I don't think Hyperloop is going to work. And uh, uh, so we'll have a bit of discussion. And let me tell you why. It's not, about the tech, it's not about the technical stuff. I'm sure we can solve the technical stuff, but the question is, do we really need it? And the point is that, you know, if you, if you today, you know, the other day I was in London, I had to go to Paris. And, you know, what I could do was actually go to Heathrow and then take a plane that's very quick, land a Charles de Gaulle, and then get stuck in strike or whatever happens in France these days, and then uh, take the, the, the underground to go to central Paris. Uh, but instead I took the Eurostar, which was actually point to point, center to center. 
Now, the two issues for me, and I think that's for discussion later, that Hyperloop, what it does, it reinvents the experience of air travel because you need to go outside of the city to an exchange that's quite big, so you cannot put it because of the cost in the city center. And then you do a point-to-point -point connection, and then you need to get from another exchange to the city. And the way it does it, the experience is, um, uh, is this kind of broken that you go outside and then you do this and so on. So it's, to me, it's like air travel with a higher capex and lower opex. You know, the, you know, you need to invest more in the infrastructure and it's cheaper to operate. The cost per mile per passengers, but love to hear from my friend, uh, later is the same as high-speed rail. And I think high-speed rail has a much stronger case to connect point to point our cities and to make them in the year of, con of connectivity you want to think experience. So even if you spend one more hour on the train, it's amazing, it will be your most beautiful office in the world. You connect with friends, you talk, you have a conference and so on. But we'll hear more later. Also, this stuff, um, I think is cool, but again, I'm not sure it's going to solve urban mobility. And the reason is pure physics. You know, technology can change plenty of stuff, but technology cannot change physics. And uh, if you want to take a mass, the mass of each of us, and put it up in midair, you need a lot of energy just you know, to keep us up there, to move air downwards, to generate the uplift, and you generate a lot of noise, and then sometimes also that mass interferes with other moving things. And that's the reason why in lower Manhattan you got uh, um, a helipad. In the other helipad, you got a few tens of flights every hour taking off, and everybody complains because of the noise, because of uh, the disturbance, uh, also because the other day one fell and people died. So, but if you wanted to have an impact on the traffic in Manhattan, you don't need tens of flights per hour, you need tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So that will never be feasible in a dense city. Of course, it will be interesting for uh, the countryside. This will be interesting for Africa. There's interesting drone projects in Africa where you don't have infrastructure, but don't believe people who tell you this is going to solve urban mobility. That's uh, bullshit. Uh, but it can do other things. It can, uh, we can use drones, also small drones, for sensing the urban environment. We can use small drones, uh, you know, we are doing a project that's going to come out quite soon, uh, where we're using drones like for doing collaborative graffiti, so people themselves can, you know, can spray paint everything they want, even where you cannot, where, where unfortunately the graffiti people today cannot do it, so a lot of the kids in the back could be very excited. Or we also are using drones on the MIT campus to solve a very crucial issue on the MIT campus. And the reason is that the MIT campus is, um, you know, was built, was designed by engineers. And so um, it's uh, really this place where every building has a number. We are in building 9-205. And uh, sometimes, you know, somebody comes and says, well, go to building 36-926, 927. And when people get lost, it's very difficult to navigate. So we develop and design this project in order to help people who get lost on the MIT campus, in particular, Harvard students. Here's the video. Welcome to MIT. Where would you like to go? Follow me, please. and artificial intelligence lab is the largest research lab at MIT. To your right, the media lab. To your left, research. the Stata Center. Follow me, please. Approaching your destination. Have arrived. Welcome.
welcome to Sensible City Lab. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. That was great. I don't know, I don't know if you were aware, but actually we have a project with a young designer where the uh, drone is actually coming from the cover of the iPhone. From the, sorry? Oh. Imagine a miniaturization of the drone, and yeah. it's actually part of your cover iPhone. And so the idea is that you take, you know, the drones, the dronies. You so always you have selfie, your drones. You that selfie just, with the drone. Yes. Yeah, the you basically carry your own drone. Yeah. No, but I think I think drones are very good for for lightweight things, but also for the iPhone, just to get enough power. You know, if you want to keep the iPhone. I completely agree, but I think you know this is a very nice avenue because you are human-centered. Yeah. No, and I think you. Are, but I think we have to be, especially you know today. I think what we need to do today is two things. The first thing is, um, and I see we see it a lot at the Salone this year at Milan Design Week, is really technology allows us to do any possible thing. But then that's really for us a reason to focus back on the human side. We, you know, and, we and, better, better ask the question first before we just launch the technology, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yes. and, uh, and, and, and the other thing is uh, human side. And the other thing is that you know, today we can access so many different ideas. Even just the internet allows us to be exposed to so many different things. Um, and so I think the important thing is to tell what is good and what is bad. What, what Hemingway uh, called uh, the bullshit detector. 